Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. I'm Paul Nissenson from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Cal Poly Pomona. Close your eyes and imagine walking into your local supermarket. There are lots of aisles for items that can be stored at room temperature for long periods of time, such as canned soups, uncooked pasta and rice, cleaning products, beauty products, medication, pet supplies, and so on. But many items must be temperature controlled. Meats and cheeses, eggs and milk need to be refrigerated to prevent spoilage. Microwavable dinners and breakfast sandwiches and and many other products can be purchased frozen to greatly extend their shelf life. And of course, ice cream has to be kept frozen. Some items are kept cool as a matter of convenience for the customer, like sodas and energy drinks. And many supermarkets offer hot foods like chicken wings and potato wedges. The engineer is responsible for building and maintaining the equipment that keeps food at just the right temperature are part of the food retailing industry. And joining me today to talk about this industry are Diego Wood and Michael Gillette, both of whom work for the Hussman Corporation. Now, Hussman designs, builds, and maintains display cases in many supermarkets, convenience stores, and other places where cold products need to be kept cold and hot products need to be kept hot. Diego is a specialty engineering leader, and Michael is a principal engineer at Hussman's facility in Chino which is just about 10 miles away from Cal Poly Pomona. During the interview, we discuss what the food retailing industry is all about. We get into the design and engineering work behind display cases and refrigeration systems used in the food retailing industry. We also talk about topics that many engineering students probably don't think much about, such as the importance of working with customers to ensure their needs are met and the importance of communication in the workplace. And we wrap up our conversation with Diego and Michael sharing their thoughts on the future of the food retailing industry, and they provide advice on how engineering students can succeed in the modern engineering workplace. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, I am here with Diego Wood and Michael Gillette, uh, both of whom work at the Hussman Corporation. Uh, Diego is a specialty engineering leader and Michael is a principal engineer, and today we're going to be talking all about the food retailing industry. So Diego and Michael, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy days to have this conversation. Thanks. No problem. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for having us. Most of our listeners probably have never heard the term food retailing industry, so we're going to get into that in just a second. But before we do, I think it would be really helpful to get a little bit of background information about you both. So how did you both get started in engineering or uh, what was your initial early interest in engineering and what was sort of the educational and career path that you took to get to your current positions today? And maybe Diego can go first. All right. Well, I'm the non-traditional engineer. Uh, My background started off in uh, transportation design. I graduated from Art Center College of Design and uh, I just, I had an innate ability to kind of think not only as a stylist, but also kind of on the technical side. So being right brain, left brain kind of helps in a lot of the conversations that you're having when you're talking with technical people. So as my uh, 33 years of experience have come up through, um, I found myself uh, working with Hussman in a, in a technical role, but really my background is product development. And my key, my key role is really to kind of organize the tasks, make sure we have the right resources where they need to be put, and that uh, I kind of become the buffer for a lot of the, the technical people like Mike here in the organization. Yeah, Paul, for me, uh, the engineering path was, was kind of clear pretty early. I, I, I kind of had, a, had an inkling for it uh, probably early in high school, freshman, sophomore year. Um, kind of knew what I wanted to do, you know, the, the science scores and the math scores fell in line. And so I, by the time I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to be an engineering major and I um, uh, went to USC, got my uh, my BSME in, the, in 2004 and uh, started working for Hussman in 2005. So short and sweet path, but uh, a, a good path nonetheless. And then yeah, after that, I've been with the company now for 17 years and got a master's in business uh, as a result of that too. So not too bad. 
That's a lot of years in the food retailing industry. So how would you define the food retailing industry? Really, you know, food retailing has a lot to do with probably primarily is um, we deal with grocery stores. I mean, if you cut to it, convenience stores, drug stores, mass merchandise stores, food service facilities, leading food and grocery retailers. We work with a lot of, well, I should say not a lot, all of the main supermarket chains, Walmart, Kroger, Walgreens. Uh, food service example would be like a simple one would be your uh, commissary, your cafeteria at Cal Poly. All of the uh, restaurant elements that you have at your cafeteria to heat food, um, to keep it warm for the students, to have overhead heating, to keep the food at a proper temperature for food safety. Those are all aspects of, of you know what we do at Hussman. Primarily, as I mentioned, we're in the supermarket industry. We're in C-store, convenience store. But we also do, as an example that I just gave regarding your cafeteria, it really is keeping food safe for the end customer. Yeah, well said. I, you know, nothing really more to add to that. It's, um, it's, it's the retail space for food that's either packaged or prepared and um, you know, anywhere from you know, your frozen ice creams to your, your hot serves applications. Some of the major players are you know, the Walmarts, the, uh, the Kroger's. Yeah, so anytime you go into a supermarket and you get something out that's hot or cold, it's usually 50% of the time our product. We're about, about a 50% market share across North America. Okay, so that, that kind of gets me into my next question about um, how Hussman Corporation, you know, how does it fit into the, the, the food retailing industry? So it, it has a huge market share, and you've already mentioned some of the products that it produces um, as well. What kind of services does the employees also uh, engage in at Hussman? You know, we're, we are a division of Panasonic. As being part of the Panasonic organization, Panasonic Refrigeration handles mostly Oceania uh, and China. And then with our uh, relationships we built in the industry, we handle a lot of North America. So geographically, we're North America, Canada, Latin America, and we've been around for over a century. And we've been really proud to be able to serve the food, to, food retailing industry uh, with the most customer focused solutions and innovations. So um, from a from a standpoint, we are really entrenched, especially in our division here, just to be a little clear, the specialty division within Usman, which we are a part of here at, in the Chino location, um, we are boots on the ground with customers to help them create new and significant offerings and, and merchandising solutions for their stores to help them differentiate themselves from the competition. So uh, we're the napkin sketch engineering team. Yeah, but yeah, Paul, I would just add that, you know, we, we provide, we provide, you know, hot equipment, cold equipment and everything in between to the, to the players in the, in the food retail space. And in, in addition to equipment, it could be services as well. It could be, um, you know, support. Yeah. On, on Mike's point, I mean, we have experts here in merchandising, energy efficiency, sustainability, food quality, refrigeration, design engineering, and service and installation, and retail performance. So we, uh, we have a breadth of knowledge here that lets us to be from the very beginning, from concept to launch. So if I came to your facility in Chino and you were taking me on a tour of the facility, help me envision what I would be seeing, what would I be hearing? What kind of engineers would I see working there? If uh, if you were on a tour, the, the first place you would see is probably our showroom. So we would take you up to our showroom. Um, it's uh, it's an area of our facility where we demonstrate and um, and you know display some of the best products that we make. And so you'd see the range of products that we make from hot to cold. You would uh, get to see it actually sitting in a showroom environment. So it's uh, it's like a mock store. You'd get to see what the product looks like in its actual environment. And then, you know, we'd probably take you on a plant tour and a facilities tour. And then you'd, then you'd get to see the engineering. So you'd stop by the engineering area. You'd see, most of our engineers are probably going to be, uh, you know, in the engineering space, working on something on their computer, a design, a problem, maybe a spreadsheet or something like that. But as you tour the facility, you'd probably go into the lab and you'd see the engineers interfacing with the technicians, um, talking about 
results on a screen or data or actually physically touching a case or manipulating parts or something like that. And then uh, if you went into the manufacturing space, because we are paired with our manufacturing facility in the same location, you would see uh, engineers on the floor, on the line, in the manufacturing area, problem solving, troubleshooting, um, you know, discussing ways to do things better with uh, with our manufacturing associates. You'd see uh, industrial engineers trying to optimize the way product flows and optimize the way material makes its way to and from certain areas. Mike brought up one word that, well, uh, two words that really kind of sum up. We problem solve on a daily basis. Uh, our staff of 33 engineers that we have at our facility are really problem solvers. Uh, depending on which project they're working on, they would be interfacing with customer service. They'd be interfacing with our industrial design team. They'd be working in traditional engineering deliverables, such as thermal, mechanical, and structural. But then also they would be here to support our manufacturing teams because um, we produce on average each month around 800 cases we manufacture here. Between three and 400 of those, the manufacturing line is never really seen. There's something, we call them nuts, new, unique, or different. There's some change from our standard product offering that a customer's requested that needs some type of support documentation, whether it be a method of assembly, a new wiring diagram, a new color choice. And we work directly with our manufacturing team to help them become efficient to get it through the four manufacturing lines that we have on our our facility. When I think of, uh, say, a refrigeration system, I would definitely think, you know, maybe mechanical engineers would be involved, electrical engineers would be involved. Are there other kinds of engineers as well? You know, I think he's the main one. I think most of the engineers do have a mechanical background, but uh, we do have an electrical engineer. We have um, we have industrial engineers, manufacturing engineers. But there might might even be a few guys with uh, you know some aerospace experience and some aerospace manufacturing experience. And it, you would think that would be a little odd, but um, you know those guys are pretty good at at solving problems, especially when it comes to joining arts and, and making things fit together. So, yeah, one of the key things here is even though we develop merchandisers, uh, individual merchandisers for, say, meat application, deli application, dairy. We also do full custom lineups, so a full deli department. Like, say you were going to go into a Whole Foods, if you're familiar with maybe a sushi station where they actually prepare the sushi in front of you, and there's a full lineup of cases that are in front, not only to produce the sushi rolls behind uh, a glass barrier, there's a front self-service area that all has to be refrigerated uh, to meet the requirements for food safety. So not only do we have to worry about individual cases, we have to make sure they all work together. And on sometimes we'll get a hot and cold case directly next to each other. And that's when our thermal team really starts scratching their head, how they can you know, solve the problem to make sure we don't have infiltration. Uh, probably within three to four inches of one case being to another. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, to tie it all together, you, we have uh, a regulatory engineer that will make sure everything is in compliance. We've got quality assurance engineers that um, ensure that, you know, processes are sustainable. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's quite a few different disciplines uh, uh, at this facility, for sure. And just, just a note, Paul, too. So we've got 33 on-site engineers here, multiple disciplines, thermal, uh, structural, mechanical. We also have a support staff in India of uh, 11 engineers that are there. So we're able to run 24 six. So when we have drafting or some design elements that need to be completed, when we leave our North America timeframe, they come on and they pick up some of the work. And then we just can, we have a continuous loop of engineering. So it allows us to become extremely efficient. So let's say that I uh, am the manager of a Whole Foods and I want a new sushi case to be put in uh, from your company. What would be the entire process from me initially wanting to have that case to the point where it's you know, fully installed and ready to go? How would I, as the manager, um, be interacting with your company? It really starts with our sales and sales specialists in the field. They have direct contact and relationships 
with, say, a Whole Foods, Walmart, the different divisions, and they are able to initially diagnose what the sales team and merchandisers are looking for at the different facilities. So they would really become the first point of contact. And then it goes directly to our customer service team, or it'll also go to our industrial design team. So it would go to customer service if it was something that was available currently, and it was maybe a small modification. If there's modifications that require additional testing or really something that is an extension of a platform we currently don't offer, it'll go to our industrial design team. Our industrial design team uses our three-dimensional models to create uh, visual representations of what either the case or the lineup may look like. They will call out any specific nuts, new, year, new unique or different offerings that the customer would be looking for. They will get a sign off from the customer that this is what they want. And um, then it'll come in to be evaluated by our subject matter experts in engineering. We usually give them a time frame of when we would be able to produce that for them, just because sometimes testing takes a little bit longer or we may need to go through regulatory. But I would say on normal, from concept sketch to availability, what do you say, 15 weeks? That's about right. Yeah, as long as it, you know the request isn't too wild, that sounds about in the ballpark. Right. So that's on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know we're, we're segmented to where we have support in engineering for the types of concepts you were just talking about that come from the customer. But then we also have uh, new product introductions that we do every year, which is about three to four new product platforms that we introduce each year, uh, depending on the needs of the market. So, uh, you know, we go through a full stage gate project, which a lot of your students and, and listeners would be uh, uh, familiar with. So we check all of the boxes, make sure everything's completed, and then we do full reviews internally and externally, uh, internally with Hussman, uh, and then also with our customers to make sure that we're giving them the best customer experience possible. All right, I think that's about complete. You know, um, the store manager could expect his equipment in, you know, 15 weeks. So let's say that was a scenario. Um, you know, any kind of validation that would be required would be performed at this facility before it uh, leaves, and then you know, after that, the experience doesn't end, right? Um, the equipment gets installed. Our sales specialists would stay in touch and make sure there aren't any issues or problems or concerns. And if there are, uh, we would resolve it. So, that, you know, it's 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 really from concept to installation and, and thereafter. Yeah. The key thing is we've built a very, very strong relationship with all of our customers. So even if it goes in and say the merchandisers for, let's say, Whole Foods, want something a little bit different when it gets to production from the first prototype that we send them, we have the ability to turn those around very quickly and be able to get something in front of them so they can test out um, you know, how well the, the merchandiser merchandises their product and how quickly they can turn the product to, to recur revenue. Yeah, I think for most listeners, most people out there, uh, you know, they they go into a supermarket and you know they they open a, a door to a freezer to get a bunch of frozen peas they don't even take a moment to think about all the design work all the engineering work that goes on uh, just to make that case there and keeping you know all the food cold so yeah but before i got into this industry i was the same thing i had no idea how much actually went into it but yeah it's always a funny story you talk to any engineer here when they're at the supermarket with their families Usually they get lost because they're out taking a look at cases and making sure that there's no frost on the glass, making sure the temperatures are right, make sure there's no scratches. It's definitely one of those career things that you have when you go to the supermarket. So what is day-to-day -day work like for both of you? Uh, Diego as a specialty engineering leader and Michael as a principal engineer. Um, and if you could provide maybe an example or two of, of a specific project that you worked on to help the listener get a better idea of, of what you do. As, as the chief engineer leader for the organization, really, I'm part of the leadership team here at the facility for specialty. Um, also, I have responsibility for two other manufacturing facilities. Uh, and what I say that is I have engineering resources there. So we not only produce specialty product at our facility. We also produce it at Bridgeton, Missouri, uh, Monterey, Mexico, and Tijuana, uh, Mexico. So 
My day-to-day is more around a strategic approach, working with sales, the product management team, project management, to make sure that we have clear definition on projects that are moving forward so that uh, you know Mike and his team have the information they need to be able to uh, start their journey. Yeah, I would. Um, so my day to day is uh, fairly consistent. We'll start the morning by, you know, going through the the important messages and the emails and the calendars and making sure that I have a, you know, a path to the end of the day. Uh, respond to things that I need to as necessary. Um, there's always a morning stand up meeting to discuss things that are in test or in development. Uh, and then after that, it's um, it's you know, getting activities done or attending meetings or participating in, in important portions of the, you know, the day-to-day needs of a facility. Um, an example would be a project I'm working on right now is a, is a big upright grab-and-go merchandiser. It's uh, it's in testing right now uh, for an alternate refrigerant, right? We, we are kind of susceptible to different refrigerant rules, so uh, we're testing for that right now, and it's got to go through various product requirement specifications for testing, and so we uh, we formulated a test plan and I'm supervising that effort between myself, the lab engineers and the lab technicians. In the morning time, I'm we're calling out which path we're gonna take and uh, we monitor results and crunch data. And uh, you know, tomorrow we'll do it again and the path, the path might change, we might deviate, we might uh, stick to it. Uh, but in the end, you know, the desired output is technical excellence, technical performance. Um, and then, you know, it's just a, a good product for our customer. Yeah, I gotta say, Paul, you know, Mike's being very humble. Uh, Mike has full responsibility for performance of all specialty product, not only built at this facility, but all of our other facilities. So even though he kind of gave you a day-to-day breakdown, really, he's also he's also become the subject matter expert, and he's a very close confidant of the other teams within Hussman uh, when it comes to technical performance around our products. So not only is he got in charge of the stuff he's doing and working with his team on, and, and just to be very clear, you know, principal engineers have always been very, very technical, right? They like to have their little labs and they have to have their little space and they're very, they're very, uh, uh, they have a lot of ownership, let's say, around that. Uh, in our organization, Mike handles the role of not only becoming the technical subject matter expert, but he also is, is sometimes the technical cheerleader, the technical, uh, you know, he really is the champion for everything that is technical within our organization and plays a lot of different roles. And he wears a lot of different hats. So as you as you listen to the things that we do here in the, at Hussman, is that it really is not clear each day which projects you're working on, but you, you do it with um, um, a lot of uh, entrepreneurialistic uh, passion. Uh, this is a good point. There are no shortage of hats, but uh, you know, we um, we we wear them well. And uh, you know, that one example that I gave might be at one facility. There might be uh, multiple developments happening across various facilities, and I, I do have my hands in in many of those activities. But you know, the supporting cast also plays a, a significant role. So you know, I might might be one point of you know technical consultancy, but we've got great technicians. We've got great uh, engineers uh, across all of our facilities that are all working towards that one common goal of, you know, an excellent problem. So a little while ago, Michael mentioned that, you know, he he knew nothing about or he wasn't that familiar with the food retailing industry before he got into it. Um, Diego, was that the same way for you as well? Yeah, it really was. I mean, I was, I don't want to say oblivious to really what it took to keep, you know, the food safety aspect of of going to your local supermarket and making sure, you know, it's 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 going to uh, enhance our the lives of a lot of different people. But uh, once we got into this industry, I can't speak for Mike, but I have a very strong appreciation for making sure uh, that everything is held at the correct temperature so that my family and other families can be safe. Yeah, no doubt. I can certainly echo that statement. Uh, you know, prior to prior to my start with us and. Uh, me, a, a merchandiser was just something that kept my food cold until I was ready to put it in my shopping cart. I, I, I did not pay attention to any of the, uh, you know, the, the science behind it, the, uh, the physics, um, the requirements in terms of energy and performance or airflow and, and refrigeration. It's just, 
not something that I ever thought would be very technical. You know, I, I, I came out of school thinking I was going to get into the car industry, not uh, not for retail. Yeah. So how did how did you get interested in this field uh, for both of you? What really interested me in Hussman was Hussman used the software in school that I was taught. Um, you know, at, I, I went to I went to USC and they had a licensing disagreement, I think, with uh, with SolidWorks. And so they chose Solid Edge. And uh, when I found this this posting, uh, I found a company that used Solid Edge. And I was like, OK, well, that might be a good fit. I'm very good at this software. So uh, I applied. Uh, it was an entry level position for me. I, I needed to you know, put some roots down. And um, and I did. I came in as an intern. And I haven't left. So <laughs> I, I, I had no idea what. Other than doing the you know the pre work for the interview and, and checking to to see what the company does, I had no idea what was you know fully involved in that. I did know that it involved refrigeration technology, which I knew very little about. You know, it was barely covered in in, in thermodynamics in school. But um, you know, it, it started off as an entry level interest, and it grew into a, a career. To be honest with you. Yeah, pause. I had mentioned I, I came out of the industrial design group. My background was transportation design. So, of course, I had a little bit of understanding of thermal, but uh, my first life was in the RV industry. Uh, I'm a local boy. I'm from San Bernardino. So I grew up in the area. Um, and then I, right out of college, I went to go work for Fleetwood Enterprises, which was a local manufacturer and designer of, of motorhomes and still still is in some aspects. After, after about 15 years with them, 16 years with them, I wanted some international experience. So I traveled quite a bit, China and Taiwan, and did a lot of work abroad. But then as my, my kids got older, like every story, wanted to spend more time at home. Uh, and this unique opportunity came uh, for Hussman. And really what, what intrigued me about Hussman is uh, they have a value system, uh, and it's integral uh, of how they do work is really we're measured on how we do our work and what we get done. So it's not just what you achieve for the for everyone out there. You know, you have certain metrics you have to achieve each year. It's making sure the performance is correct, making sure you get your your projects done on time, making sure that your budget is is correct. But 50% of what you do is also how you do it. They measure you and and you're evaluated on how well you work as a team, how you have ownership of what you deliver. There's there's many aspects of what we do and how we do it here at this facility specifically that is extremely entrepreneurial. There is a great team atmosphere and culture within this organization that really intrigued me to be part of. And, and that's the reason I'm here. It's really because of the, first of all, the opportunity I was given. But second of all, it's the culture here at Hussman that really, you know, I don't, I can't speak for Mike, but doesn't really set any boundaries of what you can achieve. They kind of give you a goal and they give you things that you need to achieve, but they don't necessarily micromanage how you get there as long as the customer experience is always exceptional. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, part of part of the reason that I, uh, you know, stuck around with customer was the was the the environment and, and the people. It's um. I definitely have a, a great time with the people that I work with. It's, it's a family environment that um, is very conducive to that. You know, it's um, you look forward to, to working with these people every day. We all have similar goals, you know, most of us anyway, and um, that we're, we're all working towards uh, a, a common thing, an excellent product, an excellent uh, result. Um, being the best in this industry, I think, is, is at the top of everybody's mind, and I think we all kind of work towards that. Yeah, and, and that, that's cascaded all the way down from the president of the organization all the way through is our mission and values are, are entrenched in the culture. And, and understanding this conversation and, and really saying that we're about a family, we are a family, but we are a hyper growth family that has had a double, double digit growth for the last 10, 11 years now. So in perspective, We've, we've created a culture that everyone is empowered, everyone is trusted within the organization because the common beliefs are all focused on the end user customer or their next customer down line, that they want to create a, uh, an exceptional customer experience. So therefore, you know, I can clearly say 
I've, I've got a team of engineers that most definitely don't wait for me to make a decision. They are empowered to be able to make decisions within their you know, frame of reference without having to be double checking and triple checking to make sure it's good. You know, one of the things here, right, wrong, or indifferent, is it's the, the customary to say it's sometimes better to ask for forgiveness than permission because they already have their marching orders and they know what they need to do. And there is alignment to what the end result needs to be, which is excellence. And everyone gets it done. So when we're recording this right now, it is uh, the middle of January, 2022. And it's almost two years into the pandemic, we're in the middle of a, of the wave of the latest variant, the Omicron uh, variant. Um, what I'm interested in knowing is, um, has the pandemic uh, impacted your work in any way? Um, and do you see any permanent changes after the pandemic? Um, I, I think the pandemic has has really made a lot of people realize the importance of having, you know, a steady supply of you know food and and um, a lot of other resources. So, has do you foresee any changes going forward in your industry? Well, I was going to mention, you know, one very specific item is is like salad bars. If you go to your supermarket, uh, because of the pandemic, all of the salad bars would take up a lot of real estate within a supermarket. Um, most of those were closed down and they were replaced. Not, not necessarily the merchandiser was replaced, but the offering inside the merchandiser was replaced to now be packaged. So, you know, I would say within 30 days of understanding the challenge with supermarkets uh, you know, Husman provided solutions to help them refrigerate those encased products in those merchandisers so that they continued to drive revenue from those merchandisers because that footprint, if, if you look at a supermarket, most of our products are on the outsides of the store, whether it's on the, you know, the left or right hand side being produce, back of the store being dairy, meat, fish, and the other side of the store possibly being bakery. Those are your high margin areas within any supermarket. So if you start losing traffic at those areas, it becomes very detrimental to the overall success of that, of that customer or that organization. So we've had to look at how our products maintain, uh, you know, good practices around pandemic protocols, COVID protocols, and make sure that we're not putting the customers in danger in any way. So that was one of the things we did right off the bat. And, you know, from an organization standpoint here, we've always taken our, our employees' safety uh, very, very seriously. Uh, we have full PPE measures before the pandemic uh, regarding uh, being in our manufacturing facility. And now we've incorporated uh, per all the guidelines uh, of state and local uh, agencies uh, for social distancing, even within the engineering organization, we've done that. Yeah, you know, the, the pandemic affected a lot. Um, I, I suspect a fair amount of it is, is eventually going to be you know, maybe the mainstay. But, you know, when, when we first went into lockdown, we had to we had to learn how to work remotely, um, something that we, we never really had to do before. Um, in terms, you know, outside of the product itself, we you know, the, the, the shortage and the supply chain crunch across the globe created the same issues for us. And so we had to adapt and, and find alternates in our supply chain the same way uh, a lot of people had to do uh, that in their industries. And then, you know, as Diego mentioned, the, the product had to, to go through some evaluation as well. We had to, we had to think it through how to uh, maybe make a product more convertible, make it more versatile so that it can handle you know, the, the needs and requirements of different health departments, it needed to be shielded or it needed to you know, operate differently. And I, I suspect, um, you know, there might be pandemic-related regulatory items on, on the horizon that, that seems like it could be realistic. Um, you know, there's nobody at the facility that doesn't have multiple masks at their desks. I, I suspect that's probably going to be around for well, another year, possibly more. Um, yeah, we just have to adapt the way we do things um, on a personal level, on a product level, and uh, as an organization, I'd say. So you both have been in this field for many, many years. How 
have you seen this entire food retailing industry evolve over time? And looking forward for the next 10, 20 years, how do you see it uh, continuing to evolve? I, I know Michael earlier uh, mentioned about, you know, they have to adjust the refrigerants as we learn more about um, things like the global warming potential of various refrigerants and trying to find substitutes for those. What other changes do you foresee uh, happening in the future? Well, I, you touched on a big one, right? The, um, the, the regulatory landscape, uh, especially in a state like California with the, with the California Air Resources Board, we, we are looking for a more sustainable way to uh, engineer the product and to ensure that the way the product operates meets with, uh, with those demands and those requirements, not just because we have to do it, but because it's a responsible thing to do. Um, so, yeah, that, that regulatory environment will sculpt the industry, I think, uh, for the next 10 to 20 years. It'll probably be the largest impact. Uh, global warming potential, um, climate change. Um, I think those things are, uh, as the as the way the, the, the California Air Resources Board legislates, we will have to respond accordingly. And, you know, they're normally the leaders for the United States, so everybody else will, will be following suit as well. Um, so in my, in my time here, I've seen... Um, I've seen ebbs and flows in, in food retail trends. I've seen uh, a desire to go to prepared foods um, from one five-year segment to the next. I've seen um, ice cream and gelato get popular and then lose popularity. I've seen uh, you know grab and goes and convenience stores really take a, a huge surge and then kind of subside. Now, if I if I were going to say or predict for the next five to ten years, what will be the the main thing I would say, we're probably going to go to more small, smaller format. I think that's going to grow. I think convenience stores are probably going to become a bit more important. Um, you know, the big, the big grocery chains aren't going to go anywhere, but I think they'll probably more be sculpted by the refrigeration landscape and, and the regulatory environment. So, um, you know, it, my crystal ball is still pretty fuzzy, but I, I suspect that's where we'll end up. Yeah, I agree with Mike. You know, uh, some of them are going to get smaller, but just over the last 10 years, if you really think about it, you've had a massive consolidation of a lot of the customers. You have Safeway Albertsons, which are have a lot of uh, brands underneath them. You look, uh, Target and Walmart now have large food areas within their stores that you never used to have. You have a significant issue or a significant opportunity with Amazon buying Whole Foods. The industry has evolved. The supermarkets are, lose, are, are really looking to maximize their basket dollar. You know, we've made a lot of strides to be able to um, extend shelf life of products, you know, in, and maximize uh, the turnover for our customers. And, and you know, it, it used to be uh, probably 10 years ago, it used to be that uh, if you looked at per capita, the food dollar, 70 percent of the food dollar was at supermarkets and 30 percent was restaurants. So let's say that was in the 70s. 80s and 90s, that went to probably 70% restaurant and less people cooking at home. And what the pandemic has done is it's really evened out that, that spend of food dollar to where it's almost 50-50 now, with a lot of restaurants actually closing or, or becoming dark, let's say, during the pandemic, where they weren't allowed to have in, in-house dining. A lot of people went back to you know, eating at home to go into the supermarket. So that's been a significant uptick in, in our overall business strategy is to be able to support that. And uh, you also have now this whole meal kit market that has come into where you can order full meals uh, on a subscription basis. And uh, so that's a new segment, as well as these large distribution, um, like an Amazon with refrigerated food where you could purchase food. And have it shipped and, and you don't ever need to go to the grocery store. So, you know, as, as we look at whether it be a dark kitchen and a, a dark kitchen is, if you really think about it, a restaurant prepares food, but a supermarket has all the food there. So what they're starting to do is actually have prepared meals in the supermarket and they're using the inventory that they have readily available in the supermarket. So they become a one stop shop. So there, there's been a significant uh, change in our landscape over the last 10 years. And as Mike, you know, so well put it, 
I think over the next 10 to 15 years, it's going to get even better uh, and greater because people are taking more of their wellness into uh, how they pick the foods that they eat and the recipes they make. So, you know, one of the concentrations is incorporating the wellness aspect into the shopping experience and pre- I, I think being able to provide some type of feedback to uh, day-to-day supermarket people on um, whether it be the blockchain of where their food's coming from or understanding what recipes they can make uh, with the different foods that they're picking up at the grocery store. Well, you've both been very uh, generous with your time, uh, but before I let you go, uh, I have one more question for you. And and so if, if a student right now, maybe they're in high school or maybe they're currently in college, if they're interested in having a career in the food retailing industry, what would you suggest to help better prepare them in high school and college for that kind of career? Would you recommend taking certain maybe non-engineering courses to better prepare? And um, you know, how how can someone gain a foothold in this industry. Michael was talking about how, I think he talked about how he would start off as an intern, if I'm not mistaken. So what would you recommend for anyone who's interested in, in entering this field? Okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put a, I'll put an engineering slant on this one. If I could, <laughs> if I could, if I could go back to Michael 20, 25 years ago and I could talk to him about, uh, you know, uh, the engineering industry and, and what it would take, I would, um, uh, First thing I would tell them is uh, stop procrastinating. You're doing that too often. It's, it's not good for you. Um, but the, the the second thing I would say is um, if if engineering is your path, and you know you you know that's where you intend to go, then focus on your on your math and your sciences. Start taking some 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 courses in uh, in data management and database management. Start start to become an expert at Excel. Uh, and the reason I would tell them that is. Um, as an engineer, you are, and it doesn't matter what engineer you are. It doesn't matter if you're aerospace or mechanical or, or biomed or, or whatever. You, you are going to be dealing with data. You're going to be dealing with a lot of data. It might be raw. It might be processed. Um, you need to be equipped and ready to handle that. And uh, I, I, I got turned on to that a little late, actually. I actually got turned on to becoming good at that in, in college. And I would actually recommend that they start from high school. Get on that as soon as possible. And then... In the times that we uh, that we live in, or the times that you're going to see 20 years from now, start to start to dabble in in computer science. Um, learn the computer language. Learn some Visual Basic or some C or or Python or you know whatever it is that's out there now, um, and start to prepare yourself for that. Because I think I think data management and understanding what's happening in in computers is probably going to be the most important skills that you're going to need outside of your specialty, right? Yeah, you're still going to need your engineering courses, your statics, dynamics, your calculus, your, you know, your vector sciences, your physics, all of that good stuff. But being able to process that information and turn it into something that somebody can use and interface with is, is going to be important. Um, and so uh, same thing for the college version of me or the, or the college student out there, right? Um, focus on your, on your major. Um, but, you know, Get into some uh, some cute computer science and some some data processing software, whether it's uh, Excel or or Minitab or you know anything statistical. But even if you're not taking a course and then start to double and then start to teach yourself um, some of that. And then you know just career wise, don't be afraid to expand your network. Don't be afraid to uh, talk to people in different disciplines and different majors. You know, in, in addition to your your engineering discipline, uh, it's it's actually really important to become a good communicator. So, um, you know, as a college student, this is a, this is a good place to maybe uh, work out some of those issues. So, uh, you know, take the time and opportunity to, to speak in front of people, to speak in front of uh, crowds, if you have the opportunity or the time, if you, if you can take an elective in, uh, in, you know, oration or public speaking, that might be a good way to get around it. Um, I would also say that skill is probably going to be, you know, really important when it comes to, Pitching your concept or your product ideas in front of uh, a, a chief engineer or a vice president or um, or you know even a, a larger audience, right? You're going to need to be able to polish and develop that skill. So, I mean, college is a great place to start to work on that, uh, even if it's not good at first. Um, the more you work on it, the better you'll get. And that would be my advice. 
Yeah, Paul, I'm sitting here with Mike and I'm kind of smiling too because I put some notes down on what my thoughts were regarding that. And I, I have exactly the same that Mike had. Um, of course, thermal, I mean, we're not negating the technical aspect of what we do. But in this new global economy, as an engineer, you're asked to do much more than the comfort level of just dumping data or you know reciprocating what you find. One of the key things that we need to do is because we we mentioned early on in this podcast the concept of problem solving. We we solve problems. We use engineering methods, data, and techniques to solve problems, whether it be thermal, structural, mechanical. So to be versatile in your thinking open to suggestion, and have the ability to influence, which is, which is key because you could have the best data in the world and it's solid, but if you lose your audience, and what I mean by audience, any given day, Mike would present technical data to the engineer staff who understands a certain amount of technical information, but then he'll also interface with product management who doesn't want all the detail, they just want to know, you know, does it hit my price point? Are you on budget? Can I launch on time? And does it offer the value that the customer requires? And then he may deal with the industrial design group or manufacturing. So he has to take the very technical information he has and be able to summarize it in a way that his customer can take in that information and do something with it. So, you know, as I mentioned, of course, thermal engineering would be my number one technical but also, you know, Mike mentioned learning another language. I, I wasn't even thinking computer language. You're right. I was thinking that now in this global economy, having the ability to speak a second language is, is also quite crucial. You know, we find ourselves in a lot of different uh, conversations where, you know, Mike uses his Spanish when we go down to Tijuana to go talk with the engineers there or in Monterey, Mexico. So, the ability to speak two different languages, to be able to use data in a cross-functional manner, understanding your audience are, are very crucial and excessive engineers, you know, within our industry. And, you know, I, I would challenge, uh, Mike had brought something up. He used the word, don't procrastinate. Um, that's true. I, I put down perseverance is, you know, find those, use your network. In college, you have a group of advisors and peers that will very, in the very near future, become individuals. You're going to probably be applying for the same positions just because it's a small community. So, you know, make sure that your overall brand as an engineer is solid so that when you get out in the industry, when opportunities arrive, you know, someone will say, hey, I remember this guy I went to school with. He was really good at thermal. You know, we should probably go see if we can find out where he's working at or if he's working. And let's pull him into our organization because he would add value. So I, I guess, you know, kind of summing it up is, is look at internships. Look at way to get real life uh, experience. Um, you know, right now, Hussman has a program internship with Cal Poly. We're extremely proud of. We're looking at a co-op program right now with Cal Poly also. Anytime you can get into a real life professional experience and work with professionals, you as a student are building your brand. And, and Paul, I would, I would also add, um, as a student, when, you, when, you're, when you're in that junior and that senior year and um, you know, you're starting to look past school and maybe look to your career, I would say it's really important to keep an open mind. You know, when I was in school, I, I took I took a bunch of courses on combustion because I was dead certain <laughs> that I was going to become a powertrain engineer at one of the one of the big car companies, right? And um, that, that didn't work out. Uh, but I don't think I would have found my place here at Hustler if I didn't keep an open mind. So that as you start that career hunt, as you start to look around, you know, don't uh, don't eliminate a potential opportunity just because it, uh, it's not what you want initially, right? Just keep an open mind um, and eventually you'll find footing in an industry that works. Well, I think you made the right decision seeing as the car industry is you know, kind of moving toward EV, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Well, Diego and Michael, thank you so much. Um, I've personally learned a lot today about the food retailing industry. You know, you guys are, are, are helping make sure our food is safe. It's just at the right temperature. Um, and I'm sure that anyone out there uh, listening also has learned quite a bit. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate you being a, us being part of this program. Yeah, no problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again to Diego and Michael for sharing their experiences in the food retailing industry. Their work is vital to making sure that we have access to safe and convenient food. Well, before I go, I would like to mention that if you're enjoying this podcast, there are a few ways to support it. You can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, and many others. You can rate the podcast and leave comments on whatever app you use to listen to the podcast. And finally, you can help spread the word about the podcast by telling your friends and family and anyone else you think might be interested in this podcast. If you have any comments about the episode, feel free to email me at tesepodcast at gmail.com and I'll place the email address in the show notes. I'll personally read each email and try my best to respond to them all. Well, take care everyone and goodbye for now.